knows more about the expansion of the universe than it does the beginning of the universe. Now, the reason why that's overlooked in a lot of churches, you will not find it in Genesis. But you will find it in the oldest book of the Bible. Genesis is not the oldest book in the Bible. Uh, that credit goes to the book of Job. But in Job 9.8, we have Job saying God alone expands the universe. Now, again, a problem is most English translations will have the verb nata, the stretching out of the heavens. But the verb nata is actually better translated, the expansion of whatever is being described. And notice how many different Bible authors speak about this expansion of the universe. It's in Zechariah, Jeremiah, Isaiah, the psalmist, as well as Job, that addresses the subject of the expansion of the universe. And I've actually debated Michael Shermer, the executive director of the Skeptic Society, on this issue. He insists that all these biblical passages are mere figures of speech, that they're not literally speaking about the expansion of the universe. But if you actually examine these passages, you'll see that the verb nata is in all three Hebrew verb forms. And therefore, it literally is declaring that we live in a continuously expanding universe. And incidentally, Jewish theologians living 800 years ago and studying the Old Testament drew the same conclusion. The reason why that was so disturbing to Michael Shermer he realized if he conceded that the Bible was declaring that we live in a continuously expanding universe, that means the Bible stood alone for thousands of years as the only book of science, philosophy, or theology that made that claim about the universe. You don't find scientists speaking about that until the 20th century, which means thousands of years ago, six different Bible authors had correctly predicted a feature of the universe that we've only recently discovered to be true. Uh, 70s, early 1970s, there's this galaxy that's obviously losing it. I mean, it's coming apart. The arms are coming off and so forth and so on. And <coughs> there is this quasar, Mark, two and Mark 205, connected back uh, by a luminous filament. We're going to a different level of proof here now. Before, we had the associations of pairings, statistical, so forth. But here now, we have an actual uh, luminous connection, actual physical connection. Uh, but this, this, and therefore, this stirred a tremendous amount of, of resistance and animosity and, 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 uh, and bad uh, criticisms and so forth. Uh, this was taken, finally, I discovered it on the 200 inch, and then this was a four meter CD, CCD photograph which showed it. Uh, and a number of astronomers with large telescopes uh, said that, con that the connection didn't exist. And well, I mean, so it sat there until last year on the web appeared this next uh, picture, which I was unaware of. Some, some friends of mine told me about it. And it turns out that there's this amateur in England uh, from the English skies, which are noted for being poor observationally, with a 50 centimeter telescope, half a meter telescope, and a CCD has taken this, and the connection shows beautifully. Uh, I think that this is a, uh, should be an enormous embarrassment to the people, the professionals with the large telescopes, and an enormous encouragement to the, <laughs> to the amateurs. And, and in fact, I, and I hope there are some amateurs here, uh, because I know the amateurs in, uh, in Italy and other places <coughs> are encouraged now to go over this whole uh, group of objects and try to search for more uh, confirmatory um, examples. But I'm terribly pleased by this. I'm terribly pleased that it came from the amateur community because they're the ones who really look at the photographs and really think about what it means. And the, the professionals tend to be uh, specialists and only look at what's uh, 
predicted by their theories and so forth. So uh, that's, that's one of the latest developments. Uh, I might say that this Markarian 205, which I called a quasar, is really sort of a transition between a quasar and a compact galaxy, a compact young AGN, what they call. They've arbitrarily set the limit for a quasar as minus 22 and a half magnitudes on the basis of their redshift distance. And, and this has confused the whole um, subject enormously because this then is just on the line between being a quasar and, and, uh, and a uh, AGN, luminous galaxy. But I suppose it's also uh, uh, illustrative of this transition, of this evolutionary uh, passage between quasars and galaxies. And the next slide will show you an example of this. Uh, this is NGC 1232, a famous SC1 spiral galaxy in the southern hemisphere. And uh, I had worked on that. There's this little galaxy that has a redshift one-tenth the velocity of light. And it's, it's, uh, I would argue it's, it's obviously interacting with its arm and uh, causing a disturbance in its arm right here. This galaxy is a, it's obviously a, a companion galaxy. And, uh, and you can see it comes out of this, this arm here. The point is that these, this is probably an ejection in the, in the disk of the galaxy. And I will argue later that they actually the spiral arms are formed by these ejections. And this is a nice tie-in with the plasma theories that we've been talking about here. Since they're moving in the arms, they're slowed down a little. They develop earlier. And this is a companion galaxy just making the transition. Uh, here, this is plus 5,000 kilometers per second higher redshift. And everybody said this was obviously a companion. And then they found out what the redshift was. And they said, no, it must be an accidental configuration, even though you could trace it back here and see where it came out of the arm and that's sort of the slot in here. Now, th this is a particularly beautiful photograph. I think it was voted the most beautiful photograph of 19 something or other. It's from the VLT, the new uh, European uh, Space uh, Organization, ESO, uh, um, eight meter on power now. And this picture is pasted on the uh, bulletin boards and the walls of all the major observatories in the world. And everybody looks at this, and they don't notice this galaxy, and they don't notice this galaxy. I talked to one of the, my friends who was responsible for posting this around. I said, you know the story on this? And he said, yes, yes, I know, I know, but we don't want to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> this is a, uh, one of the Atlas of Peculiar Galaxies, known as ARP-105. And uh, here you see a beautiful example of ejection. Here's this uh, uh, ejection coming down this way. Uh, it's called Ambar Tsumion's Knot. And it's obviously uh, uh, a uh, galaxy in the making. Here's a quasar redshift 2.2 over here. The ejection has obviously gone off in the other direction also and punctured this galaxy and formed this big uh, uh, plasma loop out in here. So this is sort of an example, of a physical example of what happens when you can see these ejecta where they intersect other material, what, what they're like. There's a whole lot of uh, companion galaxies in this area. And the next slide shows that they're uh, systematically redshifted. And you see this is at 8,500 kilometers per second, and they go up to 8,900 kilometers per second. Every one of these companions is redshifted. And this is another terrible controversy that's been going on for years and years. And, and the professional and the conventional astronomers say, no, that uh, this is just an accident because uh, if, if these are really velocities, of course, you should have as many coming toward you as going away from you. And in fact, they're all positive, which means that there's an intrinsic component in there. And even though I've been saying for years that if you look in our local group and the M81 group, that 22 out of 22 of the companions are all positively redshifted, people will still say, well, it's not a big enough sample or maybe an accident and so forth and so on. <laughs>